Okay, so <clears throat> tree rings. We can see patterns. You can actually drill a little hole into a live tree to be able to count the rings. You don't have to cut it down. And this will not only be something where you can count the rings, get an age, but also tells you something about the history of conditions there. You can do chemical analyses, uh, but also this, do we see wide or narrow rings? A wide ring means that the tree grew a lot during that time. Conditions were good. It had the right amount of rain and temperatures were not too cold, not too hot, that type of thing. A very narrow ring suggests the tree didn't grow much. <clears throat> Maybe the weather was bad. Maybe something happened. There was an outbreak of <clears throat> disease or bugs or something like that. So by looking at the tree, we not get not only how old our tree is, but something of history of conditions. Now, if we find a dead log and look at the rings in there, maybe we'll find things that match. Say, for example, back early on for a live tree, we find a set of seven good years followed by seven bad years. <clears throat> okay. Then in this log, we find those seven good years and seven bad years near the outside of that tree, not long before that tree died. So now we can match it up and put together a longer history of conditions. And so in a place where you have a number of old dead logs as well as live trees, you can actually build up a fairly long chronology going back on the order of 12,000 years or so by counting tree rings and matching up between multiple logs. <clears throat> Plants, like any multicellular organism, go through a process of development. And the changes that take place from that first fertilized cell all the way through the <clears throat> body as it was at the time of death. <clears throat> so, say we're dealing with a seed plant, that seed grows into a juvenile plant. When the juvenile plant's old enough, it will then <clears throat> develop the reproductive structures as an adult. Here's an example. This happens to be a <clears throat> mustard family sort of thing. So here's our little baby <clears throat> plant, not long from being a seed. It's still got the two cotyledons, so it must be a dicot. <clears throat> Apical mayor stem, so the shoot's growing up, the root's growing down. We get our juvenile plants starting to grow here. Eventually it reaches the point where it's producing the flowers and ultimately seeds. To do this, the cells must differentiate. <coughs> A starting mayor stem cell looks like any other mayor stem cell, but once it has divided and it's maturing, <clears throat> different genes will be turned on and off and that particular plant bit grows into say a piece of a leaf or a root or whatever that needs to be there. <clears throat> Even some unicellular organisms will have changes in gene expression through their development <clears throat> controlling different things going on in the organism. Certainly something multicellular complex like ourselves, we need all sorts of <coughs> changes in gene expression so that cells with the same DNA know to make, say, an eye or an ear or whatever particular part they're doing, just as plants need the right parts. And so as this occurs, the plant will grow into the particular types of parts, it goes through morphogenesis. key thing here are the signals that the plant obtains that tell the cell where it is. <clears throat> and so different concentrations of chemicals tell the plant <clears throat> this one is up the top, good place to grow a leaf. This one's down the ground, grow root features, these types of things. <clears throat> 
Also, different types of plants have different patterns. They have a particular shape of leaf. <clears throat> and are the sides smooth, or do they have more toothy edges, things like that? A lot of variation there. Of course, the function of the leaves is primarily to capture light for photosynthesis. As we'll see, leaves can do other things too, but that's the main job of most leaves. So uh, a leaf's design is going to be good for capturing light, capturing carbon dioxide, getting rid of the oxygen, and making the plants food. <clears throat> Relatively thin, waxy layer. On the one hand, the leaf needs to not dry up, but it needs to be able to get the gases in and out readily. And so <clears throat> you've got that balance there, light to come through, things like that. <clears throat> a big part of that is regulating those stomata, the holes that can open and close. When do you open and close them? Complication on leaves. Some leaves are one whole piece altogether, but there are also a number of plants where what's technically one leaf is actually divided into parts. So, for example, these three leaflets here of poison ivy are part of one larger leaf. Another feature of different plants, useful identification, is the pattern of how the leaves are on the stem. Do you have alternate leaves, like the picture on the license plate here, where we've got one leaf and then another over here? Or do you have opposite leaves, where you have two leaves directly opposite each other, like the plant really has? as opposed to the picture on the license plate. Also, that bird should not be yellow. They really did not do a good job on the picture. <clears throat> you can even have multiple leaves around one spot on the stem. The veins on leaves can be different patterns as well. Parallel veins are typical of monocots, or you have more of a net-like or fan pattern that's more typical of our dicots. <clears throat> Examples again, here we have two different styles of compound leaves plus a standard non-compound leaf. <clears throat> here we have alternate opposite in a whirl, <clears throat> veins more spread out, are branching ones or the parallel pattern. Leaves, again, all three of our tissues. We've got the vascular tissue, dermal, and the ground tissue. The <clears throat> ground tissue is where most of the action is going on for photosynthesis. Now, true, those cells need the fluids that they're getting from the xylem coming in and they're providing nutrients to the phloem going back out, <clears throat> but the actual photosynthesis is going on in our ground tissue here. <clears throat> of course, dermal will be on top and bottom of the leaf there. There's space for the gas, <clears throat> carbon dioxide coming in, oxygen getting rid of from the photosynthesis. Again, as mentioned before, <clears throat> plants are taking up water and most of that water goes out, evaporated through the tips to help move the rest of the water through the plant. It's quite a significant <clears throat> component of how water is evaporated out of the ground. It has actually a big effect on climate, things like that. <clears throat> no surprise, warm, dry, breezy is more evaporation. And so more water going through. If it's more humid, less water can evaporate because there's more water already in the air. And the plant has less of the water movement through the plant. Eventually, 
leaves and sometimes even branches and of course flowers will reach the point of getting old and falling off. And so <clears throat> this is technically known as abscission. Even evergreens, if you pay close attention, they are losing <clears throat> leaves. It's just that they don't lose all of them at one time. <clears throat> In deciduous plants, these leaves characteristically change color. Actually, typically they do when they fall off evergreens as well. And so there's a concentration of losing the leaves in the fall for around here. In other parts of the world, it might be at the start of the dry season, things like that. So there are particular chemicals made up by the plant hormones. Certain cells secrete it and it travels to the plant signaling to do something. <clears throat> okay, if you're going to get rid of the leaves, well, no sense throwing away something you could use. So nutrients that are in the leaves are moved through the phloem onto the rest of the plant. <clears throat> the chlorophyll, that's very useful stuff. So that gets broken down. So the components are available to make more chlorophyll when the leaves grow again in the spring. Without the chlorophyll, we can see other colors of things that are in the leaf if we have them. So for example, carotenoids and the cyanins giving some of the colors that we see in the fall. But there are other things you can do with leaves, as I mentioned briefly before. True spines, like on a cactus, are actually very highly modified leaves <coughs> protecting the plant. Cactus typically live in dry areas. They've got a lot of water in the stem for their own use. They don't want some animal coming along and eating them. <coughs> And so those spines provide protection. Another modified leaf type is the tendril. This is found on vines. It's a thin bit that can wrap around something and help hold the plant in place. Special scales, such as those covering a bud, provide protection for other parts of the plant. <clears throat> Brats are another type of specialized leaves. For example, in this picture of the poinsettias. What color flowers can you see here? It's something of a trick question. The flowers are yellow. These red things are actually leaves associated with the flower. <clears throat> now, functionally, they're acting like part of the flower, but anatomically, they're not quite the same. Another very familiar example, this is dogwood. <clears throat> the things that look like petals that are white or pink on dogwood are actually bracts. The true flower is the little tiny thing in the middle. Leaves can also make up a bulb. These are typically largely underground structures. <clears throat> Each layer in here is a very thick leaf being used for storing nutrients rather than for photosynthesis. You do also have some stem in the middle of the bulb there. And then the true roots are coming off the bottom of the bulb. Cactus stored its water in the stem, but there are plants that store water in the leaves. <clears throat> and again, water storage that typically means you're in someplace dry in order to need to store water. And so you have succulents with thick leaves that have lots of water in them. This is a pitcher plant. Pitcher plants actually use their leaves to track insects. They have water inside, and the plant secretes enzymes into it to digest things. And so if an insect falls in, and the plant's trying to help it do so, it's got hairs pointing down, so it's slippery, easy to slip down, hard to climb up. <clears throat> And, and then the insect gets trapped in there and digested, and the plant gets nutrients, largely <coughs> nitrogen, proteins, from the insect. Okay, from leaves, stems. <coughs> uh, stems, well, if there's no good having leaves if they don't connect to the roots. <coughs> we need to have something in between there. These can be thin, same with something like grasses or other <clears throat> herbaceous plants. 
or very massive, the tree trunks, vines, things like that. Again, stems usually, but not always, above ground. Soft or firm wood. So stems, of course, they're holding up the leaves and <clears throat> the flowers or cones, or whatever the plant has. They hold vascular tissue for <clears throat> carrying things up and down. And also in growth, we have buds, new tissue, forming off of there. Some stems, and for that matter, some leaves and roots, also are able to grow into a new plant, so you have some specializations there. Um, like leaves, other things that things can do. <coughs> Thorns, technically not quite the same as spines, they are stem pieces that <coughs> are protecting the plant. Tubers <coughs> are <coughs> underground storage stems like potatoes, rhizomes, maybe on the ground, maybe a little bit underground, <coughs> a horizontal stem connecting parts of the plant. <coughs> you can also even have epidermis, dermal tissue that alone that makes up spikes. Roses actually have prickles, not true thorns or spines. <coughs> 